Hey, hey, what's going on, church? I am so excited for Church Online today. Hey, I hope that you have people around you. I hope that you're inviting people to join in with this. If it's a few of you, a lot of you are really encouraging us to do church together because listen, community is where it's at. Maybe you're listening on this in your car. You can still watch it on YouTube. We are glad that you're here. We're gonna do something a little bit different today. We're gonna have some worship and some songs at the end of the message, but we're gonna jump into the last week of Jonah. But before we do, for you tuning in today. If it's your first time guest, my name is Sean Jensen. I'm the pastor here at Authentic Church. And if you're tuning in for the first time, first off, thank you for joining us. You could be doing anything else and you're joining us. And so if you could take your phone, trust me, this is is really good. Take your phone, text the word guest, G-U-E-S-T. I think it's on the screen for you, just in case I misspelled it, to 815-566- 8696. If you could just take a few seconds to do that, you'll get connected with our church and we will let you know what's been going on and we would love for you to do that. So we've been having a lot of fun going through the book of Jonah and we are in week five, which is our last week of going through the book of Jonah. And I think I saved the best for last. So I want you to lean in and I want you to get what God wants to speak to you today because it's going to be a good one. And if this is your first time, we do a series here. We take a few weeks to talk about either a book or a topic. And we've been in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. And we're going to unpack him here in a second. But we're going to pray for this online experience. We're going to pray and ask God to speak to us. And then we're going to lean in to what he has. So Lord, we thank you, first and foremost, that we get to come and gather together. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to continue to speak your word in freedom. We thank you, Lord, that you're still building your church, that we're hearing amazing things. We're seeing people come to Christ still online. We're seeing first-time guests. We're seeing people inviting people over. So Lord, today, I pray that our hearts wouldn't be in the wrong places. Lord, I pray that we would be open to receive today. You're gonna do something brand new. I believe it in Jesus' name, amen. You can type amen there in the chat if you'd like, or maybe a clap or let's go, let's do this. So uh, before we get started in Jonah chapter four, which is our last chapter, uh, I, have you, I have to ask you a question. Have you ever been shocked by something someone's response to a situation? Like, have you ever been shocked at the fact that they should have responded one way, but they actually did the opposite? Like, for instance, I have a young daughter actually going to give birth. I'm not giving birth, by the way. That's, I don't know. My wife's a superhero. But my second daughter named Charlie, when she was a baby, about a baby to one year old, we would end up going to gender reveal parties and we would take her with us, obviously. And just to let you know, when one person gets pregnant here at Authentic Church, it's like everyone does. It's just one of these things that's happening. We're going through one right now. But we were at all these gender reveal parties. And the first time we showed up, we got to the part where they found out if it was a boy or a girl. And sure enough, just like it should, everyone started cheering and laughing and there was joy. But in the midst of all of that joy, there was a shriek of crying and sobbing and yelling. And it was Charlie. She was terrified. Her response was opposite of what they had. And we forgot all about it. We laughed. We were kind of sad. It was heartbreaking, but it was kind of funny. And then a few months later, we're at a gender reveal party, forgot all about it. And sure enough, when the reveal happened again, Everyone was happy and joyful and celebrating. And then we hear, and Charlie was crying again. We're like, oh yeah, we forgot. So you better believe by the third time, we were watching her this time. And when everyone was excited again at the third gender reveal party, we watched her and she got like the, you know, like when the baby is smiling and all of a sudden they go, and you know, it's about to start, like it's like brewing. And sure enough, her response was that of, of fear, of crying. And you're like, what does this have to do with Jonah? Well, before I read chapter four, verse one, you have to understand, let's recap real quick. Jonah was a prophet of God. That means he spoke for God. God told him to go to Nineveh to preach against this great city who was wicked and evil. Jonah said, nah, Joe, nah. He said, no, he ran the other way. And as he ran the other way, he was disobedient. And because he was disobedient, he put sailors in harm's way. A great storm brews up because he's disobeying God. He gets thrown into the storm. A fish swallows him. Last week, we find out that the fish vomits him back on the shore. God gives him a second chance. And we were celebrating last week because we are we serve a God of second chances. And he gets up. He goes to Nineveh this time. He does what God's asked him to do. He preaches. And listen, 120,000 people are saved by God's mercy. In that moment, they turn their heart to God. This is a big deal. Church, this past two weeks, 
weeks, we have seen two people change their hearts to God. We have seen two people follow Jesus. So let's just take time right now to celebrate. We are full of joy. That's why we started our church. Now, can you imagine 120,000 people in a day? I'm sure there was a party going on. They were celebrating. It was crazy. But Jonah, his response was a little bit different, much like Charlie's was at the gender reveal. Check it out, Jonah 4.1, when they should be celebrating, when they should be excited, Jonah says this, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. Are you serious? This was probably like trending on social media. This is probably being tweeted and retweeted. There's a, there's a huge revival happening in Nineveh. This is amazing. People are turning their hearts to God. And Jonah is mad. He's upset. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of shocked by his response. And some people say, well, why would he be upset? Well, don't worry. We find out that Jonah begins to, you know, let us know why he's upset. And we see it in verse two and three. This is what it said. So he complained. Some translation said, so he prayed to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left that left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish. This is why I was disobedient in the beginning. I knew you are merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Verse three, check this out. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Okay, that makes sense why Jonah was angry now. No, it doesn't. Are you serious? Are you telling me Jonah is angry because God is good? Because he's compassionate? Think about it this way. Could you imagine like a kid that you're talking to, you're talking to him, he's angry, he's upset, he's so mad, he's like at a tantrum right now, he's pouting, just like the prophet Jonah, by the way, he's called the pouting prophet in this moment. He was the reluctant prophet, now he's the pouting prophet. Those are some powerful nicknames. But, uh, but we look at this, imagine a kid, he's upset and mad, and you ask him, why are you upset? He goes, I'm mad at my parents. And, you know, sometimes like, well, I can understand that. Maybe he got his phone taken away. Maybe they grounded him. Maybe they disciplined him. Maybe they raised his voice at him. Maybe they said something hurtful. And so you're like, I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. Why are you upset with your parents? And what if he said, well, I'm so mad at them because they're so kind and they're so compassionate. They're so patient with me and they just love me too much. They give me too much grace. We would be like, hold up. So you're mad that your parents love you? It doesn't make sense. When you read this, Jonah is saying, God, I am upset. I knew that you were merciful. I knew you were compassionate. I knew that you were full of unlaving love. You were slow to get angry. But Jonah wasn't really mad at the character of God. See, Jonah was not upset that God had this character. Jonah was upset that God was giving this character to people he thought didn't deserve it. For example, my wife, if you don't know her, is probably one of the most kindest people you can ever meet. I'm not just saying that, she is. She's amazing, she is gentle with people. Man, she'll give you the shirt off her back. She thinks about others. She gives everybody the benefit of the doubt. And me, I'm just a person that's like, I don't trust anyone. Like they, they looked at me weird. Oh, they're trying to get something out of me. Why are you saying hi to me? Why are you being nice? And she gives people the benefit of the doubt. And there's times that we get angry and there's times that we get upset with each other and we argue and I'm upset with her because I feel like she is allowing people to walk all over her. So something will happen and she goes, well, you got to think of it this way. Or I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they were like this, or maybe they had a bad day. And I'm like, girl, don't be so naive. They're walking all over you. And we'll get in so upset. And I'm upset with her because I feel like she's being naive. And I'm like, you're just giving them too much grace. You're giving them too many chances. They're just walking all over you. But the funny thing is, I will say that to her, but let's say another day when I raise my voice at her or I am quick to get angry or I make her feel littler than what she should be and I, I put her down and, and, and when we get in an argument and we start fussing about it, I'll look at her and say, babe, I don't know what's going on this season. You just need to give me some grace. Hold up. Isn't it easy to say, I like the characters you portray when you give them to me? 
but it's hard for me to understand when you give them the people I don't feel like you deserve. Man, let's just talk about it. Let's talk about it right now. Jonah is upset because he doesn't think this wicked. Remember, Ninevites, they would chop your friend's head off, give you the head and tell you to walk around the city. That's how crazy they were. So Jonah's like, I like the character of God, but I don't think they deserve it. And last week, we celebrated second chances. Last week, we got excited. Last week, we were pumped because God gave us second chances chances. But if we were honest for ourselves, Jonah got a second chance. But so many times we are not very good at giving other people second chances. And we get upset that the same grace we got, why do they deserve it? He wasn't upset the character of God. He was upset of how he was operating in it. I guess I could say it this way. God has forgiven them, but Jonah has not. Jonah has not. So maybe you're here today and we're dealing with this. Maybe we're people who are good at receiving second chances, but if we're honest with ourselves, maybe right now we're upset with God, not because he's good, not because he's merciful, not because he's uh, slow to get angry, but because we think that those people don't deserve it. That's where Jonah was. So real quick, I'm going to talk about this because maybe you're where Jonah is. I'm going to reveal a couple things that we can do. But before you do, maybe you're here saying, well, that's not me. Everyone deserves God's grace. Everyone gets it. But, but let me just throw out some symptoms real quick that says maybe we are people who are hard to forgive others. Maybe we are holding in to some of this. How do we know if we are pouting? Here's the thing. How do we know if we are pouting? Well, the first thing is we are angry large amounts of time. Remember it said in verse two that he was very angry. He was upset at the Lord. He was so angry. Have you found yourself in the season more angry than joyful? Have we found ourselves in the season more upset and mad than happy and at peace? If we are seeing more of our day full of anger, maybe just maybe we need to unpack and say, why am I being angry? Is there some things or some people in my life that I have a hard time forgiving? Number two, we have become irrational. Remember in verse three, he said, just kill me now. You see, when anger gets so intense, we get so emotional and we get irrational. Like on social media, it's like, I don't want to talk to you. Unfriend me if you don't believe this. I don't want to, it's not that we're not hurt. It's not that you're not right. It's just that we become so irrational that we can't even rationalize. We can't even have conversation. We just go to the deep end. We go from left to right, pendulum to pendulum, swing to swing. And we become irrational because the anger has built up inside of us. Are you angry? angry a lot of times? Is it hard for people? Is it hard for you to be reasonable in this season? Maybe with your wife, maybe with your kids, maybe with your coworker. And the last thing is this, we are waiting for others to fail. We are waiting for others to fail. Jonah 4, 5, as Jonah continues on and God speaks to him, I love what it says. It says, then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. So pretty much he's like, cool, whatever, God, God's grace, yeah, I get it, whatever. I'm gonna sit up here though and watch. I'm gonna wait for them to fail. Now, I'm not saying anybody, obviously you guys are great Christians, you're great followers of Christ, but for me personally, and I might be too real with you, have you ever, like me, got to a place where like, yeah, I, I, I know that they're forgiven, but I won't be mad if they lose their job. Oh yeah, I, I know they're forgiven, but I won't be mad if they lose in life and not win. We sit back and we wait for people to fail. We're scrolling through social media and when they have bad news, we kind of get happy inside. Why? Because they kind of deserve it. What we are saying is they deserve that, forgetting that we deserve that too if it wasn't for God's grace. So I don't want us to be angry anymore. I don't want us to continue to say, man, I am angry. There are some things I am. I do need to forgive my father. I do need to forgive my mother. I do need to forgive my classmates. I do need to forgive that bully and that person who has hurt me. I do need to forgive us because I'm angry and I'm getting irrational and I'm sitting back. And instead of hoping for people to win in life, I'm sitting hoping that they will fail in life. And that's not what God wants for us. And that's where Jonah was. But God is about to change his perspective. He's tried to teach him in his pouting. So if we are are pouting today, if you have found yourself pouting like me, I'm going to give you two things to help us when it comes to helping forgive others so that we can see them win in life and so that we can be free from this anger and this thought process and that we would stop pouting. The, no, the number one thing that God first uh, talks about and he confronts in Jonah with the first thing we have to do is this, we have to change the way we view ourselves. We have to change the way we view ourselves. Now listen, 
Trust me, we say you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves you. You are his creation. Please hear me as I share this point. I am not trying to tell yourself that you should look bad at yourself. But I think sometimes we look at ourselves greater than others. And we have to understand that the same sin that they struggle with, even though it looks different than ours, all sin had to be taken care of by the cross of Jesus Christ, which puts us on a level playing field. So how does God respond to Jonah's tantrum? What does God do when Jonah says, just kill me now. I'm upset for what you're doing. What what does God do? He displays the same character Jonah is upset about. He's patient. He's loving. He's compassionate. And he takes time to teach us. Maybe you have kids at home and they throw a tantrum. And sometimes what we do is we just say, shut up or this. But what we should do is say, okay, we got to get down and say, why are we throwing this tantrum? What is going on? What is, let's be patient and kind. God gets down. Even when we're pouting, after our second chance, he takes time to teach us. And he asked this question to Jonah. And I believe he's asking us this question right now for those holding on to this unforgiveness. Jonah 4.4, 4, the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Is it right? What a powerful statement. Now, I don't know if you understand this. Essentially, what God is asking Jonah is even if he even has the right to be upset about this. Pretty much what he's saying is, who died and made you king? Have you heard that phrase before? Every time you're growing up, like growing up on like the backyard or you're playing sandlot or whatever, and someone comes in and starts telling you the rules and all this, and everyone's like, whoa, hold up. Who died and made you king, right? Who, who put you in charge? Who put you in charge of this game? Who put you in charge of these things? God is essentially saying, Jonah, dude, who died and put you as God? Who put you as king? You see, we got we to gotta view ourselves. We don't forgive. We have placed ourselves. When we don't forgive, we have placed ourselves in God's seat and have come to the conclusion that we are the ones that get to decide who receives grace and mercy and who doesn't, right? Jonah was mad because God was displaying his grace to who he wanted to share it with. He loved it when it was his, but he didn't think God should give it to Nineveh. And what is he doing? He's saying, God, I know you're God, but if I could just take that seat for a little bit, I will become judge. And he's saying, you gotta change the way we view ourselves. You see, Sean, when you want to get back at someone, when you wanna get revenge, when you are angry at someone, what you are doing is you are elevating yourself to a point because you don't think God's handling it right. And man, we've all done this. I can do this day to day. And God has shown me, even as I preach this message, that I got to view myself different. That I got to humble myself. That I got to remind myself that I needed a second chance. I love this because Paul, he, again, was the one who needed a second chance. He was a murderer, Saul. God uses him. He's writing half the New Testament. He's writing the book of Romans. And as he's writing it, he's encouraging. And he's writing these things that actually is pretty um, blunt. So I'm going to read something that seems very blunt. But remember, the goal is to look at ourselves. Romans 2, 1 through 2, it's in the message translation. He says this, those people are on a dark spiral downward. But if you think that leaves you on the high ground where you can point your finger at others, think again. Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know one. Judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection in your own crimes and misdemeanors. What is he saying? Oh, I know that they're on the spiral down roll, but that does not give you the spot of higher ground. That doesn't mean that you forget about the things that we have done and the areas that we have fallen in. He says, when we begin to criticize others, it's a great way of escaping, escaping the detection in our own lives. Jonah, in this moment, man, when we begin to point our fingers towards people, we hide behind our hand, forgetting that we need it too. And Paul was trying to tell them, and he says in other translations, essentially saying, hey man, take care of the plank in your own eye before you take the speck of sawdust out of your brother's eye. Jesus said this. He's essentially saying, quit putting yourself so high and mighty because when you begin to judge others, you condemn yourself. Because the moment you criticize them for their sin, you're condemning yourself because you have the same sin. But he continues on and he says in Romans 2, 4, and this is the NIV translation, he says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? 
Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. So he reminds us, look at ourselves. We are not in this place of judgment. We are not in this place where we decide who God gives mercy to and who God gives grace to. He says, don't be pointing your fingers. Remind yourself of what you have done. Remind yourself that that God has given you grace and he's been tolerant with you. He's a patient God and it's kindness that turns you from the sin. We needed the kindness of God Those who have been forgiven much, forgive much. So it reminds me of the story in the Bible when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and this woman comes in as he's hanging out with them and she actually was known as the prostitute in that time and she fell at Jesus' feet. And as she fell at Jesus' feet, she began to wash his feet and they all got mad and said, why are you letting her do this? They did not understand. And so Jesus tells them this parable. We're not going to unpack it. But what they begin to say is she has been forgiven much because she experienced God's grace. She realized her need of a savior. And when she realized just how much she had been forgiven, she realized that she could give forgiveness to others. But the Pharisees sitting there, they didn't give her any forgiveness because they didn't realize that they need to be forgiven. And when we don't view ourselves in light of the cross, we forget that others need the same forgiveness we need. How do we stop being so angry at those who hurt us? Maybe it's an intense thing that has happened to you. Maybe it's just a daily thing. Maybe it's just a, a bully thing. Maybe it's just, that. I'm not saying it's just a thing because it seems real to you. But what I'm saying is you're so angry and you're so upset with re- relatives. You're so angry, you're so upset and it's hard to forgive. You're gonna have to remind yourself that those who have been forgiven much, forgive much. Remind yourself that, yeah, you know what? They, they may do that wrong, but there's some things that God is still working out in me. We got to change our view of ourself. And the second thing that God reveals in here is he says, we got to change the way we view others. So first off, we have to change the way we view ourselves, that we, we were just as much as sin as anybody else. And God gave us grace so that we could have a second chance. But the second thing is we got to change the way we view others. Remember, Nineveh was an evil city and Jonah viewed them that way. Yet for some reason, God viewed them a different way. He saw their wickedness. He saw they were evil. He saw the destructiveness, but he also saw their value. He also saw them as his own. He also wanted to give them grace. Not only does God remind Jonah whose right it was to display mercy and compassion, he teaches Jonah, listen, about a value system. See, Jonah's value system, much like ours and much like mine on a daily basis, is kind of skewed. The way we value things in this earth, the way we value things in this world when it comes to money and price tags and people and and their actions and their accolades, we place value on people based on what they do, not what they're worth. And we look at people differently than how God looks at them. And so remember Jonah, God, God is teaching Jonah this. Jonah realizes, says, whose right is it? Is it your right? Is it your right to be angry? And Jonah's like, whatever. And he goes and it says that he builds a shelter outside the city, like we read, and he's waiting to see what happens. And something crazy happens. I'm going to unpack real quick. It says in that moment that God arranges a plant to grow up over him and shade him. And it says that it brings him great comfort and he loves that plant. He's just like, yes. You know, like that moment when it's so hot out and you find that glimpse of shade and you're just like, this is great. And so he's enjoying this plant that God had provided for him. He arranged for him. But then the scripture says something funny. It said that God also arranged a worm that ate the root of the plant and the plant died. And then he arranged a scorching heat to blow on Jonah. So now that will mess with you a little bit. I don't have time to unpack it, but there's something here. He loved this plant. God takes the plant. He gives, he takes away. He sends this heat, right? Because he's providing for us to teach us. He's doing this just like the whale. He provided the whale, the fish. And then this is what happens. Jonah gets so upset. He's so mad because it's hot and he's angry. And let's just be honest, when you're already angry, all you got to do is turn the temperature up a little bit for us to lash out. And in Jonah 4, 9, God again, teaches them and ask him another question. He said, did God say to Jonah, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted. Listen, even angry enough to die. He was really upset about his plant. Uh, now, let's just be honest. There's some crazy plant ladies watching this right now that 
if some of your plants died, you would be the same way. You're just, anyways. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? This was God's mic drop moment, but it was something so powerful. God was teaching Jonah about his selfishness and how he viewed others. Listen, he said, are you mad about the plant? He goes, yeah. He goes, so I don't understand. If you could care so much about a plant, why can't I care for this city? Essentially, he's saying, you care more about this plant than what you do these people. And let's just be honest, guys. Sometimes our value system, it's skewed. We have things in our life that bring us comfort that we love and we value our, our, our comfort and we value these things more than we value other people. Jonah cared more about his plant than the people. He cared more about his comfort than the people. His value system was off. And guys, from time to time, I know for me, my value system is off. See, Jonah saw trash, God saw treasure. When we need to forgive people, we need to realize how God sees those people. See, in Luke 15, Jesus, again, is teaching a bunch of Pharisees. He's talking to them and he says something so crazy. Actually, he uses a whole book of Luke, a whole chapter in the book, Luke 15, to talk about lost things. And the whole purpose was because the Pharisees and the religious teachers of that time, the ones in the priests and the temple who, who really didn't love the, the sinners and the outcasts and the misfits, they turned their head against them, but Jesus was hanging out with them. Jesus was hanging out with the misfits and the outcasts and they did not like it. And so when they confronted him with it, he shared these stories because here's the truth. He's saying your value system, it's skewed. Your value system, it's off. And so he told three stories to help them understand their value system. And the first story, he talked about, um, he talked about a hundred sheep and he says, imagine a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one leaves, one is lost. He goes, wouldn't the shepherd leave the 99 to go rescue the one? This was eye-opening. So he's saying he's going to leave the 99 who are together right now and he's going to pursue the one. Why? Because he sees value in the one. You may not see value in the one, but Jesus sees value in the one. Then he tells about this lady who has 10 coins and she loses one of the coins. It says she carefully sweeps the house and she looks for it. And when she finds it, she rejoices and everyone gets excited that she found her one lost coin. So once again, he's saying, I know she still has nine coins, but just one coin is the same value as each one of those coins. And so I'm going to pursue it. Hear me out. What we pursue is what we value. We can tell the price something is by what is paid for it. How much the value is, is how much you pay for it. What Jesus is trying to show them is he's trying to say, I pursue what's valuable. And what the cross revealed is that Jesus paid a high price to show everyone watching online right now just how valuable you are, how valuable that bully is, how valuable Nineveh is. And when we leave our house today, whoever we come in contact with, he's saying they are valuable. They're like a son to me. They're like a daughter to me. And if they are God's children, they're like our siblings. And the third thing he talks about, he talks about the sheep. He talks about the lady who pursues the coin. And then he talks about the son. There's two sons and one of the sons asks his father for the inheritance and he goes and he spends all of it. He goes to Vegas, right? He plays the tables. He loses all the money. He, he, he buys women. He buys girls. He wastes all of it and he has nothing. And he has to look at himself now. And he says, the only thing I can do now in my lowly state, I have nothing. I'm eating out of pig troughs. I am at the lowest of lows. I just know if I go back home that, that at least my dad would hire me as a servant. And it says, as he's coming back, working on his speech on what he's going to say, his father sees him. It says, full of compassion, just like God, runs after him, hugs him, and throws a party, kills the calf, gives him clothes, and says, we are so glad you're back. You're not a servant. You're my son. But the other son didn't like that. You see, when he came home, he was like, what's the party for? And he goes, your, your brother's back. And he got so mad, so mad that he accused his dad. He said, dad, I've been here the whole time. 
You haven't thrown me a party. You haven't gotten me clothes. You haven't gotten me these things. And look at what it says in Luke 15, verse 31. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had celebrate this happy day. Why? Because your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he was found. So in this picture, Jonah is this brother. Nineveh is the lost son. And God is reminding Jonah, you love that plant so much. I get that you love that plant, but can I tell you, you didn't even make the plant. I made the plant. And these people in Nineveh, they're my creation. They're my children. And it said that they're in spiritual darkness. They are lost, which means if we are in a place that we people don't deserve the grace of God, they are lost. They're in spiritual darkness. And we have to realize we got to view our self differently, but we have to remind ourselves that they just have the same value as everybody else. That's what he's saying. Have we elevated ourselves to the judgment seat? Have we begun to view people as insignificant because we're looking at the outside, not the inside? Everywhere we go this week, they're like that lost coin. Everywhere we go this week, they have value. Everywhere we go this week, God sees that person. Jesus died for that person. All of us, all of us were worth dying for. Essentially, God is saying, Jonah, I know it's hard to understand, but even though they look wicked and even though they look like this, they're like my lost son. And we want to party when they come home. And so church, as we close this Jonah series, we got to remind ourselves today, we love to receive second chances but especially in this climate, especially with what's going on in our nation right now, especially when it's so easy to be angry at every post, especially when it's so angry, easy to be angry at different groups of people we don't even know. We have to do some soul searching and remind ourselves that if we needed the grace of God, then the other children need the grace of God too. That everyone we come in contact with, our, our wives, our husbands, our relatives, friends, neighbors, that we would see them the way God sees them. A simple prayer I've always prayed with me and my girls is this, Lord, let me see people the way you see them. Come on, let's pray that right now where you are. Right now, if you're comfortable, say, Lord, let me see people the way you see them. I think it's time for us to take ourselves off the judgment seat to ask God to do a deep work in us and to say, God, I want to see people how you see them. And not just that, I want to pursue them how you pursue them. Remember, we know the value of something by what's paid for it. So I can tell you what you love and what you think is valuable by looking at your checkbook. I mean, we can say we love our wife, but if we spend more money going golfing than we do taking her on date nights, what we're saying is I value golf more than I love my wife. And so when it comes to reaching lost people, when it comes to doing what we are doing as a church and you are giving generous and you are pursuing and you are forgiving, your life is saying, I see value in them. We don't just say it, we live it. So let's come off the judgment seat. Let's ask God to see people the way he sees them. Now, before I pray for you, I want to ask you three questions for the discussion questions this week. I don't just do this. If you're with people, I want you to take a picture of these. I want you to unpack them. We're going to go into a worship uh, segment, and I would love for you to unpack worship God for who he is and to begin to change your heart in these things. But here's three questions for you. Number one, is it harder for you to receive grace for yourself, or is it harder for you to see others receive grace? Number two, is there anyone in your life that you are having a hard time believing deserves the same forgiveness you have? I know I've been there. I know there's some people that I have to work on right now. And the third thing, this is going to take action on your part. Do not miss this. This week, ask the Holy Spirit to help you make a list of people you need to forgive and start praying for them to experience the love of Jesus that you've experienced. Those are your discussion questions. And right now, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to pray for you, church, that we would give others second chances, that we would see people the way God sees them. And then I want to pray for people who need to respond to Christ, meaning maybe you're like Nineveh. Maybe you've never experienced God's grace and you need to start a relationship with God, just like the two people the last two weeks. I'm telling you, it's the best decision you ever make. doesn't mean life is easy. It just means that you have purpose and hope in this crazy, chaotic life. Lord, I thank you right now in Jesus' name for those watching.
Holy Spirit, first and foremost, in my heart, I've been convicted by this message. Man, I'm so quick with people next to me, Lord, to not give them the same grace that has been given to me. So let me see them of value. Help me get off the judgment seat, Father God. I can't bear that. That's too big for me to bear. I pray, Father God, that we would be led by the Holy Spirit. Bring to our heart right now who needs to be forgiven. Bring to our heart right now who needs to be forgiven. Bring to our heart right now and help us to have strength to pray from. Lord, I know that there's been people watching right now who've been wounded deeply. They said, Sean, you have no idea what these people did to me. And Lord, I am not belittling that. But Lord, this isn't for their freedom as much as it's for our freedom. We have to forgive them. We have to say, God, you know what? Justice is in your hands. Yes, give them grace, but you also take justice, Father God. We're leaving in your hands because we don't want to live as a pouting prophet. We don't want to live as angry and upset all the time. Heal us deeply, Father God. If we're angry with our church, if we're angry with other people, if we're angry with people on social media, family and relatives, now's the time. This week, Father God, let us find healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before you go, if you need to make a decision to follow Christ, we're going to pray a prayer, but I need you to pray with me. Romans says that we have to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, which means you were, you were uh, paid, your debt was paid on the cross. And when you believe in Christ, what you're saying is, I made, sin, I made sinful mistakes and it has separated me from God, but I'm receiving the grace of Jesus to clean my slate, to start a brand new life. If you need to do that right now, pray this with me. Say, Father, Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's not be like Charlie and cry. Let's celebrate. We are not angry about that decision. Come on, let's let them hear it. Let's celebrate them. And if you made that decision, it says that all of heaven is rejoicing. You are now a brand new creation, a clean slate, a brand new start. I pray the Holy Spirit would fill you and give you direction as you walk this out. And if you pray that, please, please do this. Right where you are, you can lift up your hands. Say, that was me. We may not see you, but say, that was me. That was me. Right where you are, say, I pray that. Right at your computer screen on your phone, raise your hand right there. And then grab your phone and text the word follow to 815-566-8696. Please do that because you're going to get in connection with our connections pastor and they want to walk with you, pray for you and encourage you and help you take the next steps for you to begin to live the full life God promised for you. What an awesome series it was, Jonah. Man, God is so good. I cannot wait till next week. We're starting a brand new series called DNA, not what we do, it's who we are. And guess what? Our worship director, Chris Hageman, is going to be bringing the word. It's going to be powerful. So let's find some people. Let's invite some people over and let's watch it together. But right now we are going to sing and we're going to reflect on this message and we're going to give God praise. I love you, church. <laughs>